Hi, my name is Pedro Doria Maia and I'm an acting assistant professor here at the Department of Applied Mathematics in the University of Washington and I'm happy to present for you guys today a series of lectures in computational neurology. So what is computational neurology? Uh, it is the study of, uh, of mathematical, theoretical, and computational study of neurological pathologies that arise in the brain, okay? And uh, I will make a series of video lectures on this topic, delving a little bit on the math that we use to tackle this problem. And uh, I'm very happy that um, I can use uh, this light board technology to film these lectures uh, thanks to uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics here at UW, okay? Um, so without further ado, let's start our lecture today. And uh, all the work that I'm going to present in these videos uh, are joint work with my PhD advisor and my, post and my postdoc advisor, Dr. Jane Nathan Kutz, also here in the Applied Math Department, okay? So let's start with traumatic brain injury. So Traumatic brain injury is roughly, uh, can be roughly defined as damage to the brain resulting from an external mechanical force, okay? So it can, be, it, it can happen due to rapid acceleration of the head, due to blast waves, crush, impact, penetration by a projectile, or sometimes that we're used to see in media due to concussions and contact sports, okay? So there are many forms of TBI and what happens is that like the kind of pathologies that uh, that arise that follow traumatic brain injuries are very different depending on the type of TBI, okay? So to do that, researchers uh, have developed an array of experiments, of in vivo experiments, to try to mimic all the possible different situations in which TBI can arise, okay? So here's a setup for instance, uh, where they put a, right, uh, a rat here laid down and then they have an air gun and the air gun will shoot uh, some projectile to the rat's head to try to imitate a ballistic injury. Okay. Uh, other scenarios are, for example, a free weight drop. They put the rat over there, and then they drop a weight and then they see what happens. There's a variation on this experiment where the rat is using a, a, some form of a helmet. And uh, what is very interesting is that the kind of pathology that develops after, uh, well, with and without helmet is very different, okay? Um, and finally, uh, they put sometimes mice in a shock tube and uh, which, which they can control some form of like explosion and they can expose the mice to a blast wave, okay? And this is to mimic the sort of injuries that soldiers experience in war uh, due to explosive grenades and, 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 and things like that, okay? So one of the complications of, trauma, of studying traumatic brain injury is that the pathologies, uh, they span multiple scales. So you're going to have a lot of, um, pa well, pathological conditions, but they happen on a cellular level, on a tissue level, and on the whole brain level, okay? So this is pretty much, so this is what makes the problem really hard, is that you're gonna have problems at the cellular level, so we would talk a lot about this in, the, in, in, in these series, and, uh, and, and, and these are hard to measure sometimes in vivo, okay? Um, maybe we can measure some things here at a tissue level or at the whole brain level, but to kind of really understand why the system uh, is, 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 is not operating properly, we have to understand the effects that happen at all these different scales, okay? So we really need a translational approach that will allow us to link the pathologies that happen in all the different scales to kind of like figure out the why are we observing or what, uh, lack of functionality, okay? So if you examine, for instance, the kind of images that, uh, uh, that you get from diffuse 
from DTI, uh, you can kind of say here's like the shape, roughly the shape of like uh, of, of, of a brain, and here's a brain of an unexposed veteran. To so this is our control, and if there's and here's a veteran with possible TBI, and you can start to see that you, the, the scan can start detecting some anomalies here at the tissue level. And then veterans with probable TBI, you can see that these anomalies are a little bit more, um, uh, are a little bit heavier, right? You can see it a little more strongly, okay? Uh, but then we don't know exactly what's happening at a cellular level, okay? So, even if, uh, and, and another complication is that even mild traumatic brain injuries can lead to cognitive deficits. So uh, at a cellular level, uh, we will observe a lot of axonal abnormalities and they are known to contribute to post-traumatic cognitive impairments. And these things are super hard to measure in vitro, basically because you would have to open the patient's brain, take a piece of the tissue and put it on the microscope to figure out what happened at a cellular level. Okay, so to study what happens at that scale, uh, researchers also develop a, a array of experiments to be done in vitro, so to the neuron cells themselves. Okay, so here is an example where like you grow neurons on a petri dish and then you put them, uh, you know, it's like under the influence of here of this rubber impactor that will descend uh, and it will inflict injury to the neurons, okay? And uh, try to mimic like a concussion maybe or repeated concussions or mild TBI or even strong TBI. Another setup um, and that, that, that is somewhat common is to grow neurons on a Petri dish that you can stretch and then give this really high speed uh, stretching on, 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 on the media and this high speed stretch will kind of like create some form of like wave, right? And, uh, and, and it's supposed to mimic the kind of like effects that you get from like a blast explosion, okay? And so independent of the nature of the TBI, all the studies point to a convergent degenerative mechanism, at least at the cellular level, which are these things called focal axonal swellings. Okay, we're going to abbreviate FAS for the rest of the, the talk. Okay, so what is an axonal swelling? So uh, axons are the pipes in which the neurons trans uh, use to transmit information right from one neuron to the second neuron. And here's kind of, and, and you can see that, well, the, the average diameter of this axon was supposed to be this. And right here, you see these enormous changes in geometry, okay? So these huge swellings that are also known as varicosities, as uh, bulbs, ovoids, spheroids, and uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, names for these things, okay? But uh, in the end of the day, what we're looking at are these like dramatic changes in geometry. And this is complicated at a very fundamental level because, well, if this neuron is trying to send some form of information to the neighboring neurons encoded on spike trains, you'll have the spike train traveling throughout this kind of a complicated road, right, with these huge changes in geometry, and that will affect the content of the spike trains. So the spike train that starts here, that, that might look very different from the spike train that comes outside, uh, that come a a after propagating through this axon, okay? And um, these changes in geometry, they can also be very dramatic. They can be sometimes even 30 times the average diameter of these axons. So we're talking about like a, uh, now what's gonna, uh, uh, impaired signal processing, of some form of reverse signal processing that will happen due to the interaction of the electrical signals with the inhomogeneities created by these anomalous geometries, okay? So here's a couple of other images now with uh, immunocytochemical staining of these axons. So now you can see kind of like why they call them bulbs or ovoids or spheroids because some of them do have these shapes, but some of them do not. Some of them present more complicated geometries, okay? And we'll explore that in more details later. And, um, and here, 
uh, are examples of axonal swellings from an 18 year old who died from a vehicle crash. In this case, since uh, the, the person died, they were able to do an autopsy on the brain, examine the tissue, and then they verified that, yeah, the neurons were full of focal axonal swellings as well, okay? Focal axonal swellings are also present in uh, a number of other neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, FAS are present in Alzheimer's disease. So here you can see, okay, like the, like the bulbs here, where you have accumulation of certain proteins and some other intracellular material. Okay, so this is really zoomed in version of it. You can see the big bulbs, the big varicosities, the big swellings. So they're present in Alzheimer's as well. It's also known that sometimes TBI can accelerate uh, the um, occurrence of Alzheimer's disease. And they're also present in uh, multiple sclerosis. So in multiple sclerosis, people tend to think that uh, demyelination is, uh, is, well, demyelination is probably one of the most important factors there, but swellings are also present uh, on multiple sclerosis patients as well, okay? So here you see the bulbs, the varicosities, and that's gonna create all sorts of um, problems for propagating information within a single neuron and consequently disrupting the activity of the neuronal network and the, and the biological functionality of the system, okay? Well, thank you very much.